yeah, so I'm Mike Walter, Principal Anal Analyst at Forrester Research, and uh, I want to talk to you about analytics and applications, and uh, more specifically, how analytics are really changing the next generation of applications that we're going to build. So I always like to start with, why are we doing this? What are the business priorities? And we surveyed a large number of uh, global business leaders, and we said, what are your priorities? And it's really no surprise, they said, to improve the experience of our customers. Now, it's no surprise now, but you know, if it was 2009, it was reduced costs, uh, but it's really about uh, improving the experience of the customers. You can also see some improve the product, uh, reduce costs, of course, is always there. But this is what's top of mind for most businesses. How can we improve that customer experience? And I think the, the reason for that's obvious, right? More loyalty. You'll keep those customers, you'll gain more customers. And really where this is coming from is, or headed towards, are these hyper-personal relationships. And way back when, when my great-grandfather had a corner store in East Boston, people would come in and he would know them and he would know exactly what they wanted, right? And then we moved to the next era, era of uh, mass production where it didn't really matter what people wanted. It was more about mass production. We tried to get back to that market of one and segmentation. Remember 1995, a market of one? Now we're there again with hyper-personal real-time relationships. And the key reason why we can even talk about this, and I am going to use a buzzword, big data um, and analytics. So at Forrester, we call this the age of the customer. And I just net that out, and I call it celebrity. And really what that comes down to is customers in the digital world, co connected customers, they want to be treated like celebrities. And how do you treat someone like a celebrity? Well, you get to know them. You know what their wants and needs are, right? You don't treat them like everyone else. So imagine, George, imagine you walk into a cheesecake factory. What menu are you going to get? You're going to get the same menu that everyone gets, right? Because you're not special, right? But if George Clooney was going to walk into that cheesecake factory, they would be preparing. They understand that George Clooney loves prosciutto. Okay, and they are going to prepare a very special menu for him, and they're going to give him a menu that's totally prepared for him. Well, I can imagine a time when we do walk into the Cheesecake Factory, and number one, they know that you walked in, and number two, they know more about you, right? And so what companies are, are, are striving to achieve is to build the next generation of applications that are hyper-personalized. So I call these celebrity experiences, so versus user experience, you have to learn about the individual characteristics of your customers, detect what they're doing in real time. Someone, some people call that context. And then you have to adapt your applications to serve that individual customer, not a segment, not a persona, you, you, you. So that's sort of the goal from a business standpoint. And now I want to ask you guys a question. This is a real question, so I'm expecting answers. How well do you know this consumer? Male, 35, single, lives in New York, makes 100K a year. What do you predict he would do if the bank accidentally deposited 5,000 in the account? Give the money back or take the money and run? <laughs> I'm looking for an answer. I'm sorry? A. Sir, what, why do you, uh, so give, okay, hold on. I'm gonna give, here, here's an A answer. I'm going to give the B answers a chance. So, sir, you say he'll give the money back. Why? Um, seems like a guy who won't do such things based on the other characteristics. All right, you, it seems like he won't do it based upon the other characteristics because maybe he's making a lot of money or, okay. Any, anyone think it's B? <laughs> <laughs> Because he, li he lives in New York, he's going he's gonna to take the money and run. <laughs> Sir? Uh, he says it's B because he wouldn't even notice. Yeah. So, so you're saying you don't, if 5,000 drops into your account, you don't know. Wow. I want to be you. <laughs> all right, now look, all of these, you all have an answer, right, in your mind. And you are beautiful people because you're human beings. And one of the things that the human mind does so well is we fill in details so that we can come up with an answer. But if you really think about it, you don't have enough information. 
right? You really don't have enough information to really know whether it's A or B. But that's exactly what we need to know. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm about to give you a little more information about this individual, and then I want you to tell me what you think this individual will do, okay? <laughs> What's he going to do? Take the, I heard take the money and run. I think it's unanimous. Now, those of you who don't know George Costanza from Seinfeld, if you watch this show, there's no question, 100% probability <laughs> he is going to take that money and run. He probably will get caught, but he's going to take the money and run. Right? So if we can understand our customers as well as we can understand George Costanza, wow, it just opens up a whole new possibility uh, for applications. How do we do this? Well, that's why analytics is, is such a, a hot topic these days. We need analytics to do it. And you need four types of analytics, okay? So true business intelligence means having these four types of analytics. Most companies have invested in descriptive analytics, collectively billions of dollars and, and millions, if not billions of dollars per year on traditional analytics reports and dashboards, right? And that's historical reporting. What they haven't done as much is invested in these other three forms of what we call advanced analytics. And that's predictive, streaming, and prescriptive. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these advanced analytics. So people actually get that these analytics are important. And you can see this data that I've circled here. You can see the, the upper data. It's like, all right, traditional analytics, yeah, they get that. There's no real difference between 2014 and 2015. But look at some of the lower categories, like predictive analytics. Look at the difference between 2014 and 2015. Look at the difference between 2014 and 2015 for streaming analytics. That's a big difference. Okay, so there's a really, there's a surge in companies who are reporting that they're interested in doing some form of advanced analytics. What I love about this, though, the opportunity, is that most aren't doing it right, because it's less than 50% reporting doing any of these forms of advanced, advanced analytics. So if you're doing it, wonderful. If you're not doing it, perfect time. So to do these sorts of analytics, of course, you need data. And of course, people like to say, oh, data is the new oil. I really don't like that. It's far too limiting. It's more like the sun, right? So there's plenty of data out there for us to analyze. And most organizations have more data. And I'm not going to run through these sources. You get it, right? IoT, social data, and even transactions. There's lots of data running around. And we ask companies how much data that, that they have. And I wonder where your company falls um, in this. Um, but that's plenty of data. I mean, this isn't necessarily petabyte scale data. Some companies, I think, have petabyte scale data. They do. We have another chart that breaks us down uh, even more. Uh, but there's plenty of data to analyze. But our data shows that companies are only analyzing about 12% of the data that they do have. Okay? And they also have plenty of sources, internal and external. So there's plenty of data. And all data, if you think about it, is born fast. It's born in an instant. It's born when someone clicks. It's born when a temperature sensor records a temperature. It's all born fast. But for some reason, most analytics is done later. And that is a function of this whole BI traditional descriptive mentality. We collect all the data and then we analyze it later to see what happens. Now I'm not saying you don't need that, you do need that, but guess what, you already have that. So now you need to look forward to predictive streaming and prescriptive analytics, why wait? Why wait to analyze that data tomorrow, or, or yes, tomorrow, a month from now, a quarter, annually, why wait? Why not analyze that data right now? I call this perishable insights. Perishable insights can have an exponentially more value than after the fact traditional analytics. So think about what that means, right? There's some insights that you gain right now, like when George Clooney walks into that restaurant, you have to act on that. You don't, you know, if we analyze that last month or next month and we say, oh, yeah, George Clooney walked into the restaurant, that's too late to act on it, right? So, most companies are not capturing these perishable insights. Are you capturing these per perishable insights? Maybe a little bit, okay? But certainly not the way you need to. 
Let's look at a few perishable examples of how these advanced analytics can, can make a difference. Now, fraud is an obvious one, and many companies have already implemented fraud, the credit card companies, financial institutions, and those are examples of perishable insights. You don't want to know that the fraud happened six hours later or a day later. You want to know that it happened right now. Many financial information services companies, they want to know what people are talking about stocks. Um, in this case, this is, um, well, a, a very prominent financial information company that's looking for perishable insights that they can use for trading ideas. Uh, the IoT world of sensors, wearables. Normally, we think of wearables as a fitness tracker. There's one company that makes uh, this little band that goes on the baby, the baby's temperature, the baby's position. Uh, certainly, if there's something wrong, that's a perishable insight. You want to act on it uh, right away. The auto manufacturers have 250 sensors in that car. I don't know, Tesla probably has a million sensors in the car. And one company is working on detecting tire slippage, and then they want to warn the, the cars two miles behind that there's some slippery conditions up ahead. Okay, that's certainly a connected example of a perishable insight. Shopping examples, right, location analytics. What if these girls are in the proximity of an outlet mall? What sort of specific offers or not could you make to them, okay? So if you start to think about all of these things that you have to detect in real time, you have to predict about the individual and then what you have to do about it, that leads us to predictive, streaming, and prescriptive. And finally, uh, one of my favorites, because it came true, I sort of made this example up a couple of years ago. Um, is this why you played Led Zeppelin? Because you looked at this slide. Um, but uh, so uh, Spot, I think there's a, there's a Pandora shop, but Spotify, um, when a, they noticed more, more than 50% of the people were listening from their mobile device. So the data scientists were saying, oh, wh what can we predict? What sensors do we have? And the mobile device, of course, is the, the ultimate IoT sensor. Um, well, we have an accelerometer. So we can predict if someone's jogging or if they're dancing. And if they're jogging, we can stream music that matches the tempo of their run. A highly personalized uh, experience in real time. The problem with creating these type of applications and applications for your biz business that you haven't even imagined yet is that most firms struggle to make any of these insights actionable. Okay? They're, not, they're, they're analyzing it, they're doing descriptive analytics, but they're not making it actionable. And until recently, they also didn't have enough contextual information, enough real-time information. Mobile has changed that. The world of IoT is changing that as well. So now the applications that were running blind, now they can increasingly, they're able to see what's going on around them. So you have to build analytics into your applications. Those applications are going to be smarter. Whoops. So predictive. Let's take a look at predictive analytics and, and what you need to understand about that. Uh, first of all, predictive is hot. Um, we published a wave on uh, Forrester Big Data Predictive Analytics and was the second most read report out of the hundreds that we produce. And you can see the other, it's flanked by customer experience. Okay, so there's no, no real surprise there. Uh, but it is surprising that it was one of the only more technical reports to just make it into that top because usually it's about customer experience. And predictive analytics are tools and techniques used to find models. So typically, when we talk predictive analytics, we're saying, okay, we need to find a model. And that model is something that predicts an outcome, like what will George do? Will he take the money and run? Um, but prediction is always about probabilities. And there's different ways to create predictive models. We all, you, when you gave me answers, you had a model in your mind. We could have created rules. And most companies have used rules-based systems, and those are still important. But when we talk predictive analytics, we're talking about using big data, we're talking about using machine learning to build those models. You often need both of these. So predictive models don't get hung up on the fact that you know, no one can predict the future. They really can't. So predictive models are always about probabilities. But those probabilities can have a huge impact on the business. For example, telecom company like Verizon, a 1% increase and the predictive power, the accuracy of a model, can have an impact of tens of millions of dollars on reducing customer churn. 
And the other thing about prediction is just because you want to predict it doesn't mean there is a model, right? Every economist has a terrible, terrible, terrible record collectively. Um, and that these models are not necessary. Are there any statisticians in the room? Uh, because if there are, this is a disclaimer for you, okay? Correlation does not imply causation. So predictive models don't, in fact, it's, it, this is not, a, it's not an experiment, right? So you can see that div divorce rate in Maine is directly correlated and predictive of margarine consumption, <laughs> okay? So I'm not saying this so that you guys don't, you run away from predictive analytics, <laughs> but I just want to let you know that, you know, there, there are some, uh, that's why you need a data scientist, right? And what do data scientists do? They do, they use a combination of statistical and machine learning algorithms. Data scientists don't necessarily write those algorithms. Some do, but I would say that more it's the computer scientists that, that, that create new algorithms. Data scientists apply those algorithms to data sets to find those models. And um, many of you may be in a position to hire a data scientist now or in the future. And here's a way to screen for a data scientist. Just ask them what their favorite algorithm is. If they say Cognos or something like that, then they're not a data scientist, okay? But if they say, oh, it's a neural network or it's a logistical regression, or if they even say, well, I don't have a favorite, it depends what the, it depends what the problem is, that's good. If they can't answer that question, you can show them the door, that's a five second interview, okay? So the thing about these algorithms and the data scientists is a lot of computer science majors actually take an AI course or a machine learning course and they may have some, some capabilities. You might be able to grow a data scientist in your organization. So big data is, or, or data in general, right, is what these algorithms need to succeed. And machine learning is what finds those predictive models, what finds the predictive variables. And predictive models um, are classifiers, like classifying something like what is the behavior, recommendation engines. I mean, the Google search engine is a predictive model. It's predicting what you want when you type in those keywords. And then there's also clustering type of models. So an example of that, what customers are likely to plan a vacation in six weeks? It could be as simple as that, right? And then you could act on it. Now, prescriptive analytics, I'm skipping streaming for a second. Prescriptive analytics is once you predict something, prescriptive is what do you do about it in real time? So when you predicted that this customer was gonna take the money and run, what do you do about that? What actions do you take? So prescriptive analytics uses tools and technologies to determine the best decision or action that you take in that moment. And it may use a combination of techniques, including numerical optimization. So the Obama campaign in 2012 famously used predictive analytics um, to help uh, with the election. So they had a predictive model that predicted who's the swing voter. And now once they knew who the swing voter was, then they needed a prescriptive model to determine how to influence that person, right? Because there's many things you could do. You could knock on their door and say education. You could send them an email. You could telephone them. Not everyone's gonna react the same way. So the prescriptive model is an opportunity to individualize what you do about it. Um, now, prescriptive is a little, is, is a little more com complex because sometimes you want to build human expertise into that action as well. So it's sort of essential to have advanced analytics, but also a traditional business rules engine as well, so you can capture some of the human expertise as, as well. Um, so one of the things you can do in prescriptive is use a second predictive model to predict what to do or you can use mathematical op uh, optimizations. Like for example, I predicted which customers are gonna take a vacation. What if you're a cruise line and you have $100,000 worth of promotion and you predicted 100,000 people are likely to take the vacation? Are you just gonna give them each a dollar incentive? No, so numerical optimization, whenever there's an, uh, a dollar value or some sort of numerical, it'll optimize who to actually give those offers to. And that brings us to the real-time component of this, which is streaming analytics. And streaming analytics is what you need to capture those perishable insights and to create a real-time business and real-time applications. 
And streaming analytics essentially can detect and, th and then act on those perishable insights. So you can have all the predictive modeling capability and all the prescriptive capability and all the descriptive capability, but if you don't have streaming, you can't do it in real time. So streaming analytics is often synonymous with CEP, complex event processing, which is a feature of streaming analytics, uh, but it's not just about messaging. Okay, streaming analytics actually does do analytics. It can filter, aggregate, enrich, and analyze a high throughput of data through multiple sources. It detects those contextual situations, and then it can act on them by initiating prescriptive analytics. Now, I know it's a technical audience, so I don't want you to get, you know, get angry at me for saying real time and then say there's no such thing as real time. When I say real time, I mean business time. Okay, so when a customer walks into a shopping mall, real time can mean 30 seconds, it could mean five minutes. Wall Street trading, it's milliseconds or less, okay? So real time simply means business time for that particular situation. And thinking in streams and thinking in events is very, very different. On the one hand, it has ETL-like qualities because it has to filter out the noise and all that information coming out. It has to normalize, it has to enrich it with other data. So for example, say there's a mobile app and it gives you a lat long. Well, what is the place at that lat long? So you have to enrich it. But then the continuous analytics does correlations. It, 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 uh, it, it can detect geofences when someone, or someone or something enters a certain area but it must have time windows. It must have temporal time windows to detect um, when a pattern of events occurs in a time window. So here's an example. Let's just say we're an online um, retailer selling motorcycles, and we wanted to sell more motorcycle helmets and optimize those profits. So we may come up with an idea like this. Okay, so on the left, we have temporal pattern detection. And what we want to do is if they've clicked at least three times on a motorcycle safety product, including one helmet, then we want to display the most profitable helmets. And what if we wanted to detect that in one minute? How would you do that in code? Well, you'd have to, you'd have, to have some sort of a state machine, right? Because as soon as a new customer clicked on one thing, you're going to have to store that, and then you're going to have to wait to see if they clicked on these other things within that minute time frame. That's a challenge to write in code. Streaming analytics or CEP platform makes that effortless. On the right-hand side, say we also want to know what the real-time daily so sales totals are. Okay, if the sales are trending lower, uh, we, can we can lower the price. If they're higher, we can raise the price. We can do whatever we want. Again, though, we have to detect and do analytics in real time. We don't want yesterday's sales total or last month's. We want what is it right now. So you might be thinking, well, I can just do that in a SQL statement. But if you really think about it, you're not going to be able to do that in a SQL statement. So anyway, that is very difficult to implement um, from a code standpoint, which is why you need streaming analytics platforms. Oh. So you can't really talk about analytics these days without also talking about open source platforms, including Hadoop and Spark. So the way to think about it is Hadoop is designed for volume. Hadoop is two things. It's a distributed file system, and it is a file system, right? So it's not a database. It's a file system, but it also has a processing engine. So all of the data that we need to do batch analytics, and it's important to note that Hadoop and Spark are both batch pro processing platforms, Hadoop is designed for volume. Whereas Spark, because it's an in-memory platform, an in-memory batch platform, is designed for speed. So that's the way to think about the difference between Hadoop and Spark. And Spark does not have its own file system. Hadoop does. So, so that's why uh, Spark and Hadoop are, are often um, brought together. All the major Hadoop distributions include Spark. And Spark has something called an RDD, and that's their internal data structure. And if you had to load that from an external source, well, it's going to, the latency of loading that over the wire takes a long time. So that's why Spark and Hadoop are often co-located on the same cluster, because Spark can load that data 
right from the disk on the Hadoop cluster. Um, and Spark also can use Yarn for resource management. So Spark and Hadoop are great choices as, as batch data stores and batch processing environments, but they don't really include the real-time component. So something I call Hadoopinomics, it's made this batch analytics at scale feasible. Um, whereas uh, a typical data warehouse from a data warehouse appliance vendor, that might cost you anywhere from 25,000 to 75,000 per terabyte. The same on a Hadoop platform will cost anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 per terabyte. So this is why Hadoop is so prominently popular. And it's becoming a bit of a data warehouse as well. Recently did some research and we counted 14 different SQL uh, for Hadoop solutions. Uh, so many, many companies um, are using Hadoop as a, as a substitute for a data warehouse for new data uh, or archive data. And Spark, which has sort of taken over for MapReduce, has something called a DAG engine, which is a directed acyclic graph. And anyway, the net of that is it improves the parallelization of batch jobs. And you may also be thinking, oh, Mike, well, what about Spark Streaming? Isn't that the streaming platform of the future? Absolutely not. It, it's micro batch. Spark is a batch processing platform. And the way Spark Streaming works is basically they said, oh, what if we ran a batch job every 500 milliseconds? And that's what they did, and they call it streaming. They just run a, 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 large, number, a, large, a, a large number of very tiny batch jobs until it almost looks like streaming. But that doesn't have the scale and latency requirements for real applications. But it, it can be cool for some things. I've talked to many customers who've tried it, and they're like, it just doesn't have the latency. So be careful if you're thinking that Spark Streaming is a solution uh, for streaming. Fantastic for batch processing, jobs, predictive modeling, and that sort of thing. Now, to bring all of these advanced analytics together, um, some people call this the Lambda architecture. Um, and really what it means is you have to, the analytics is no longer something that happens outside your application architecture. It actually becomes part of your application architecture, which it probably isn't now. So you have to have a advanced analytics regime predictive, streaming, and prescriptive that is part of your application architecture, part of your application platform. And it basically looks something like this, where you have a speed layer at the top, okay, and that's where streaming comes in and prescriptive, and then you have a batch layer at the bottom that's working continuously uh, to create those predictive models, to update those predictive models, and to do the descriptive analytics as well. And that's what you need to create these applications. So one of the reasons um, why you guys are all here is because WS2 is your application platform, your middleware platform. And to create these type of applications that I'm talking about and this analytics architecture, you need certain architectural qualities of a platform. The first is access to all the data. So you need an ability to access all the data. A typical application might have a portfolio of hundreds of applications. So you have to make those silos disappear. Um, the performance of the analytics must be blazing fast because the analytics isn't something that's happening after the fact. It's happening real time. It's happening during the running and in the, in the production of the applications. And it has to scale to handle any amount of data, especially if you think about IoT and you think of all of the data that comes through. Um, I recently installed uh, SmartThings in, in my house, and I can't believe the amount of data that's generating just for my little old, little old house. Um, and analytics, because it does become part of the application, it has to be fault tolerant, right? It has to be highly available. You, there has to be some disaster recovery because this isn't just a report that goes on someone's desk that they never read. This is analytics that are creating these celebrity experiences. And because it's dealing with your customers and dealing with confidential information, it also has to have um, uh, high levels of security and encryption in there as well. And the platform has to fit 
So that diagram, that, that messy diagram, yes, that is the reality. The platform has to be able to plug in there. Um, and you have to embed and have streaming analytics to make those real-time, more personalized applications. And it also helps, uh, I'm a big fan of open source communities because I think that type of community-based innovation actually um, results in, 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 in new platforms such as WSO2 or, or the Hadoop, the Spark community. I mean, it's just a wonderful um, way that innovation occurs in software. So ultimately, you guys have to, you're the guys, are the guys who are gonna develop these applications. You're gonna design these applications. And the customers are ready for this. Okay, you saw the statistics, the number one business priority is customer experience. The way to do that is to create individualized, real-time applications. And think in your own business. What type of experiences could you create if you had those forms of advanced analytics? If you could predict things about individual customers, if you could act on it in real time, if you knew what to do about, uh, this, if you knew how to act on the situation. So every one of you has ideas about applications that can embed these type of analytics in it. And people say, well, how do you do this? Well, here's the problem. The problem is, if you take predictive, this stuff always doesn't work. So you have to think like a venture capitalist. What does a venture capitalist do? Venture capitalist doesn't just invest in one company. They invest in a dozen companies, perhaps. Right, hoping that two or three of those ideas. So you have to generate enough ideas. This is a different way of thinking for most businesses because they want an idea and they want to know what the ROI is. You have to think of these projects more like R&D. So the way to come up with a list of a dozen ideas is to walk through your business process. Take your most challenging business process. At each step say, is there something I could predict here that would improve this process? Is there something I could do in real time that would improve this process? And you're gonna have a, quickly have a list of a dozen ideas of what you could do. Same thing with the customer experience, the customer journey. Walk through the customer journey and say, is, can I predict something about this customer that would make this experience better? Okay, you're gonna have a dozen ideas and then you can work to see, okay, do I have enough data to get a predictive model? Do I have enough data to detect the real-time situation? one, two, or three of those are gonna hit, but it's gonna be fabulously successful. So once you have these ideas and once you narrow them down, then it's up to you guys to actually create these next generation of real-time applications and build this advanced analytic capability into your application platforms. Thank you.